This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. That includes Vince Power, Rodrigo Smith Zapata, John and Becky Johnston, you, and our brand new patrons, Fnord Man. I see the Fnords, Fnord Man, and Royce. Welcome to DTNS. On this episode of DTNS, Amazon tries to rescue its grocery business. Scott weighs in on Meta's open source music generator, an AI that can help detect breast cancer. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August the 2nd. There's been only two days in 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Taco Wednesday, I'm Sarah Lane. From the Beehive State, I'm Scott Johnson. I have no food reference, so I'm just the show's producer, Roger Chang. Taco <laughs> Wednesday is an innovation that I embrace. Yeah. I say there are no rules here. Yeah. Why limit it to just Tuesdays? That's right. You can also trademark that one because nobody has it. I know. <laughs> it's Taco Smart. Wednesday? Mm, yeah. Okay, Sarah can have it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's start with the quick hits. X, or X Twitter, as some people insist on calling it, will now let users who pay for blue check marks hide their check marks. A support article for X Blue explains that paid subscribers can choose to conceal the fact that they pay to be verified, but the checks may still appear in some places and various features might not be available if your check mark is hidden. In more X Twitter news, TweetDeck has been renamed to X Pro and is rolling out its new branding now. Some of it is already live at tweetdoc.twitter.com. TweetDeck, rather. X Pro is still available to anyone, but X announced uh, on July 3rd, X Pro will soon only be available to paid subscribers. Starting I will not be. I will not be reloading my TweetDeck tab as long as I can hold out. Uh, Xbox users will soon be able to stream gameplay to Discord. Uh, so video, uh, not just audio, so their friends can watch them get killed. Xbox insiders in the alpha skip ahead and alpha rings of testing can try it out right now. Uh, you got to connect your Discord account and then look for it in the parties and chats section of the dashboard. It's an option called stream your game. Streams are only viewable in Discord on other platforms, though. You can stream from the Xbox. You can't watch it in the Xbox. Uh, it's not yet available on the basic version of Discord that is on the Xbox. The government of Kenya has ordered Sam Altman's WorldCoin to stop signing up new users. Now, if you recall, WorldCoin is a cryptocurrency that will give you around $49 worth of its coins if you validate that you're a human by having your irises scanned by an orb at one of WorldCoin's sign-up centers. Kenya's Ministry of the Interior has launched, launched an investigation into the security and privacy of the company. WorldCoin's privacy policy says iris data is not stored unless the user requests it. Microsoft rolled out spatial audio for its Teams desktop app on both Windows and Mac OS after several months of testing the feature, which creates an experience where voices of everyone on a call sound like they're in distinct positions based on where they are on the screen. Microsoft does note that you're going to need a stereo-capable device. <laughs> it's not going to work in mono, uh, so you'll need some wired headsets or stereo-capable laptops. Bluetooth devices are not currently supported, uh, but the company says next-generation LE audio, Bluetooth LE audio, that's coming with stereo enabled Bluetooth devices will support it. Man, I mean, I don't know that I would care to do that in. Well, anyway, some people <laughs> have more meetings than I do. Canon unveiled the MS500, a long range, very long range, non infrared camera capable of capturing subjects in color, even in complete darkness, even mm. from several miles away. The camera costs $25,000, and if you say, well, that sounds pretty steep, it is. Canon says this is designed for commercial monitoring in high security levels like seaports, public infrastructure facilities, and national borders. And ghost hunting. All right. Uh, Meta released a tool for AI music generation called AudioCraft. Uh, this is under an MIT open source license. So it's this one's got a real open source license. Previously, they released some AI stuff under a license that excluded companies bigger than 700 million users. Uh, it was their own weird thing. Not everybody considered it an open source license. This one's just your standard MIT open source license. It's got three models. Music Gen, which turns your text into music. That was trained on 20,000 hours of music owned or licensed by Meta. Audio Gen, which turns your written prompts into sound effects. Uh, barking dogs, sirens, etc. That was trained on public sound effects. So 
Uh, they're being very transparent about what they train this stuff on. And then encodec is the third part, and that's just a decoder that promises to deliver fewer artifacts when you manipulate audio. Now, Scott, I know that you are both attracted and repelled by these kinds of things. How do you feel about this one? Oh, as usual, I am both at the same time, really, because uh, when these new tools come out, I get really uh, nervous about what they're doing, and I get really excited. I'm more excited about this than not, though. Um, in fact, there's been so much spotlight on image generation, video generation, and text generation, uh, or uh, predictive text generation, I should say, that I feel like audio has been a little bit left out. And that's not to say that there aren't services like 11 labs and a few other places that do cool audio stuff but for music all we've seen up to this point is people saying hey i can make spongebob sing a popular Katy perry song isn't that funny sure. yeah i would yeah. much rather start to see rubber meet the road on what i can use this for and already i know that i'll find this useful for podcast stuff because there's a lot of times where i'm like i have a new segment we're only going to run it twice this month and then we're done with it forever. I'd like it to be a little jaunty, maybe a little music and maybe a little sound effect to it. Mm -hmm. I got to go find it or pay for it or have someone make it or hope that what I've got is, you know, a truly out of copyright. Like I think it sift is. through dozens of tracks going like, well, it's kind of it, but that's not exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if they, if I, if I'm in the need for, I don't know, an elongated track that makes it sound like I'm at the beach and it's the summer. Uh, not that I'm prompting Tom with this at all, but if I wanted that, um, Would you like nice. a pop dance track with catchy melodies, tropical percussions, and upbeat rhythms perfect for the beach? That sounds like the prompt. Let's because go. this is that, according to Meta. This is the example they posted on their blog. Yeah, see? It's a nice, jaunty... Uh, it's what we asked for when you put that prompt in there. It uh, does sound it. very generated. Um, yes, that it, does, might it not sounds be a like a music thing. bed, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's, I, I would believe this was made by humans. Yeah. I would say it's like um, yeah, elevator music. I, mean, I, I assume, you know, all digital music somewhere started with a human being like, here's what I want. Mm -hmm. But I'm, no, I'm just saying it sounds, It I wouldn't immediately go, oh, that was generated by a machine model. Right. You? No, of course yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, Scott, uh, when, when you, oh, sure. um, you know, mentioned the scenario of like, yeah, I might need something for a podcast and, you know, I just... It might not be a whole thing where, yeah, I'm going back and forth between drafts with, you know, a, a composer type thing. You know, of course, <laughs> people who make music um, and people make music for our show, too, you know, are like, oh, man, but like I could do it real quick. <laughs> that sort right. of thing. I right. feel like these can work in conjunction. Sometimes it's, it, you're just you're needing some sort of a I don't even want to call it a one off because that's selling meta short here, too. Um, sure. It just, it seems like they can both work for different scenarios. Yeah, I feel like I uh, there's an immediacy that attracts me to it. And I know that some people are going to say, Scott, the stuff you complain about with art generation, uh, part of the problem is immediacy and you're, you're skipping over the, the talent of qualified artists. That's probably true here. Um, but given what I do, the idea of like, oh, 10 minutes before the show, I forgot. I need a stinger. It's only three seconds long, but I need a a really good stinger for the, for the mood I'm trying to create with this stinger. And if I could, you know, have a three second stinger generated by this software and maybe go in and tweak it a little bit. Cause I want to do a little after thing or put a little voice in it or something or something I want to add to it after bam, 10 minutes later, I've got my stinger. It's kind of compelling, you know, but again, mm -hmm. it, it does. So it shows us really practical use case, but it also, because I'm not a musician, it's easy for me to say, Oh, well, pff, this is easy how many people are saying that about artists? And then those are the ones I get frustrated on. So I'm trying to have the right, I'm trying to keep my mind open to how many people this possibly affects or even upsets. There uh, are so yeah. many times that you use a piece of music that you wouldn't have used otherwise because it's available or you right. don't use music or you use music and then you hear it on a motorcycle dealer commercial later, which is a true thing that <laughs> oh actually gosh. happened. No. Uh, so this is going to not replace things. This is going to make music available where there was no music choice uh, before. So you, you have to remember that side of it too. Uh, I did want to play the sound effects because that's another one where it's like, sometimes you're like, I need a sound effect. I know exactly what I need, but where can I find it? Sounds like an actual person whistling to me. Like it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little yeah. hard to hear, but I, I get I get what you're doing. It's a yeah. whistle song. Sure. Finding this that is stuff. whistling with wind blowing was the prompt. Now, that, that, that sounds. And good. one thing one would right. think you could go and 
you uh, but like all of these things you tweak your tweak your inputs and say i'd like it an octave higher or i'd like it to sort of sound like this thing but not exactly because i don't want to mess with copyright like you'd have a lot of uh, fiddling you could do and in this case all you're doing is replacing a, a human who would whistle for you at the beach and then instead now you got the beach and the whistler and no one's the wiser i don't know i and, I, and here, I, I, I feel like we've given short shrift to the fact that meta open sourced this right this right. meta is playing catch up here and i think that we we talked about that the last time they released something publicly but they are they are not holding it behind a paywall for wor worries of responsibility they're saying we trained it on just stuff we have licensed. It's only going to be Western oriented music because of that. We're making it open source so that you can train it on music. You have the rights to, uh, everyone take this and use it. The, the meta is not charging for this. That's the other thing. So, people who make music can also use this to assist them in their making of music as well. I would love well. to know what is licensed by meta. I mean, some of oh, it I, would just be I mean, what, you know, stuff I, we don't understand. Or, you know, I, I think what this means is they took music they already owned and then they said that's not enough. And they went to probably just a music library and said, we would like to pay to license this. Right. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's it's not uh, it's not music they have licensed for other purposes. Anyway, that's my guess. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, early results from an ongoing Swedish trial of more than 80,000 women undergoing mammograms show that AI is able to accurately detect 20% more breast cancers from mammograms than traditional screening by radiologists. The study is the first randomized control trial to use AI as a tool in breast cancer screening. Promising results, uh, and they were published in the journal Lancet Oncology, and noted that using AI-supported analysis of mammograms in conjunction with at least one human radiologist was as accurate as two radiologists without AI support, which led to 20% more cancers being detected because you don't need two radiologists at once. This also reduced the workload for radiologists in general who spent 44% less time reading mammograms. Here's how things worked. Half the participants had two radiologists look at their mammograms without AI. The other half of the participants had their mammograms analyzed by AI and a radiographer. In cases where AI generated the highest risk score, two radiologists then assessed that screening again. Uh, lead author of the study, Christina Long from Sweden's Lund University, says the results quote, are not enough on their own to confirm that AI is ready to be implemented in mammography screening, and the trial needs further results to indicate whether using AI reduces the number of cancers detected between screenings and is worth rolling out more broadly. Another concern is, is false positives, uh, over-detecting what are uh, ends up being a harmless lesion. Uh, if you're curious, the AI that they used is a deep learning model. It's not a large language model. It's a deep learning model uh, from screen point medical called transpara version 1.7.0 uh now sarah uh unfortunately you know more about this uh than the rest of us do w what do you think of this uh, i'm pretty excited uh i would have <laughs> i would have loved uh for this to be something that was available to me uh, about two years ago um for anybody who's not aware uh, i i well i'm still undergoing breast cancer treatment but I discovered breast cancer on my own after ha well, I discovered it on my own, got a mammogram, traditional mammogram, women do it all the time. They said, you're good. And then it turned out that, you know, I went back because I didn't feel like I was good. Um, and I did have breast cancer. Um, and at that point, uh, mammograms are sort of, that's sort of the first line of defense. And then you do so all sorts of other things. You got biopsies and ultrasounds and MRIs and surgery. And, you know, it depends on it depends on the breast cancer situation that you're in. But um, I am an example of somebody who had a mammogram, did all the right things, and it went undetected. So uh, I'm not saying that a radiologist in my case did anything wrong, but this stuff happens. So the fact that AI is at least in, you know, early trials here proving to be a really great asset for a team that, you know, their job is to make sure that they don't miss things like this. I am all for it. And I know false positives are a thing, but trust me, uh, human doctors 
they they will <laughs> they will poke and prod you all the time uh, when there is a concern for for exactly the same sort of thing. So it's not like a computer is going to be the first to 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 make things difficult on somebody who didn't need surgery. Yeah, you want you want to reduce false positives because the poking and prodding can lead to secondary infections and other risks. So you don't want to do it unless you're really sure you have to do it. Uh, but uh, that's what this study is about. And this isn't even the first study to to make progress in this area. This is another study. We've, we've covered stu versions of this before that is saying, look, it looks like this increases accuracy. I think that's mm -hmm. what you want the most, right, Sarah? Yes, uh, that is <laughs> very much what you want the most. I don't know, you know, in my case, uh, there wasn't a ton of time between that mammogram where I got, you know, I was in the clear and then I went back and said, you know, they just still don't know. I think there's something going on here. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a ton of time, but there was some time. Um, you know, I don't know how things had progressed in those, let's say, two months uh, before I, you know, ended up saying, right, let's take another look here. Um, and, uh, you know, accuracy uh, in mammograms, again, is just one way, um, you know, when, well, you know, TLDR, when you, when something is detected, then they want to test you for all sorts mm -hmm. of other stuff because they want to make sure that they didn't miss something else um, or there's not something, you know, lingering in a lymph node or, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, I know about that too. So the, the fact that radiologists, um, and I don't know if anyone besides one radiologist looked at my mammogram you know i don't i wasn't in the back room for that um and i didn't ask uh, i don't know that they would have had to tell me anyway but anything that will uh leave the expert humans to do the expert things and not get bogged down by um you know spending too much time looking at mammograms not that they're not you know that they're still the last line of defense here in the study as well um but uh to do what they do, um, and to, you know, help patients that much more. I'm just, this is one of those examples where I can't find a lot of bad reasons for this to be happening. I think this is, this is a great example of medical advancement. Yeah. And especially because this is peer reviewed research. Uh, it's, it's one of a series of studies. It's the most recent of a series of studies looking at, at this saying, all right, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. And even this one is not the one where they're saying we're done. Now everybody can use it. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. I also think it's incredibly important, uh, to state that, uh, we're very happy, Sarah, uh, <laughs> that you are here with us today to share this with you. And we're, and I'm very sorry that you had to go through all that but thank you for for taking the time to to share that insight with well, us and everybody well of course you know with any luck this will all be a distant memory yep yep fingers crossed mm -hmm. all right folks if you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show uh you can get in touch with us all kinds of ways uh on x and mastodon we are dtns show dtns s-h-o-w uh, mastodon that's at mstdn.social on tiktok we're daily tech news show on instagram and threads we are at dtns picks that's dtns p-i-x <laughs> If you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get groceries from Amazon Fresh or Whole Foods delivered. And depending on your location, you might have a few other options. Uh, here in L.A., I have Bristol Farms, Rite Aid, and Mission Wine and Spirits that Amazon will deliver as well. Amazon grocery delivery was booming during the lockdowns, uh, but a Washington Post story describes it as meeting a crisis point, with one source calling this a make-or-break year for Amazon groceries. Bloomberg reports on some of the things that Amazon plans to do to make instead of break this year. Yeah, so in a dozen uh, in a dozen US cities you'll be able to order grocery delivery from Amazon Fresh without needing a Prime subscription. You'll just pay more for the delivery fee, but you don't have to pay for Prime. Amazon says it hopes to offer the program nationwide by the end of the year and as well make Whole Foods deliveries available to non-Prime members. For Prime members, Bloomberg reports that Amazon is working on letting customers have a unified cart. So, for example, you could order some items from Whole Foods and Amazon Fresh and Bristol Farms, and that's all one order instead of having to place orders separately, depending on where you're getting the stuff from. Now, Tom, you recently posted 
more than a couple threads about being disappointed with Amazon Fresh. So what was all that about? And does this change your mind? <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually ended up relying on Amazon Fresh. Uh, I, I did some Ralph's pickups. I did some Instacart. And I ended up relying on Amazon Fresh through lockdowns uh, to, to bring me a lot of my groceries. At the time, the uh, minimum for free delivery was $35, not $150 like it is now. So it was a little easier to swallow. Uh, and it did very well over the course of the lockdown. However, the last three times I've ordered Amazon Fresh, uh, it has been bad is what is how I would, I would use that word to describe it. Uh, substituting things that weren't really the right substitution, like or grapefruits instead of oranges, uh, telling me that they were out of water, like not even offering me like, well, we don't have this gallon of water. Do you want bottles of water? Just like, no, we don't have any water anymore. I'm like, that can't be true. I've been in the North Hollywood Amazon fresh. There's, there's gotta be water in there somewhere. Uh, and then being late, uh, just, just being, uh, I've got a window between 9 PM and 11 PM and not showing up until midnight, uh, Ooh, in a yeah. couple of cases. Yeah. So I've been looking at it and wondering like, well, is it just the North Hollywood uh, manager changed and and is, is not uh, riding the ship uh, very well? Is it something more systemic with Amazon? So when I saw that Washington Post article, uh, I was interested in that uh, because it could explain that they're in a transition phase uh, and they're letting a lot of things slip. There was a lot of anecdotes in that Washington Post story of employees saying, yeah, they laid off a bunch of people and now nobody's in charge and the things are expired because the person whose job it was to to go through and check expiration dates isn't here. They seem to have laid off a lot of middle managers, which could explain, you know, why there's some organizational issues. Yeah. Uh, it would be good for them to write the ship because it was a good service. It's a little expensive for less quality service now. I do love the idea of unified. I, I sometimes have to choose like, well, actually, I want a couple of things from Whole Foods. So I'll give up on a couple of these other items that they don't have at Whole Foods uh, and vice versa. They have some Whole Foods stuff available through Amazon Fresh. A lot of the the 365, like their their generic mm -hmm. in-house brand. But but yeah, I I I think there's a lot for them to do to make this work better. So I'm I'm encouraged to hear they're doing it. Scott, where are you in grocery delivery? Do you do you use Amazon Fresh? So we never did. Um, we kind of thought during the pandemic that would be what we'd do, but we ended up using Instacart. And since then, it has been so seamless and uh, never needs intervention that we just kind of stuck with them. I have a feeling that's going on with a lot of people that kind of established themselves as the go-to name and brand a little bit like, I don't know, DoorDash kind of became the Kleenex mm -hmm. uh, delivery to the door. And it felt that way for them. So and they kept we, adding more and more outlets too. That was impressive to me. Yeah. We kept getting, we kept thinking, Oh, we're not gonna be able to get this. And then we'd find out, Oh no, they totally can do that. And so we were always like pleasantly surprised and we never had a problem. We've, we've yet to ever have an issue with, with using them and we don't use them as much as we did during the, the mega part of the pandemic, but we use them enough now to say that, you know, they're a reliable service that I would keep paying for. I really like them. Yeah. When, when uh, Amazon bought Whole Foods, everybody thought Instacart was going to die because Whole Foods was what they were for. Yeah. That was you the know? narrative. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they, they and really I used to see around. Instacart people all over Whole Foods um, and I thought, gosh, yeah, where, you know, all these people, you know, they're, where, where are they going to, you know, shop for others at, and turns out lots of places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you have the luxury of time to be able to, to drive and park and shop for your own groceries, it's certainly cheaper. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just more intensive. And I know, especially a lot of working parents out there are relying on, on delivery and finding a good, reliable and inexpensive way to get that delivery is uh, even without pandemics, I think something people have realized, oh, wait, that's going to help me quite a bit. Well, we have a tech privacy story for you, uh, but I need to make sure that there's a few things you understand, because I'm guessing not everyone in our audience is up on the K-pop scene. So uh, number one, Jungkook is a member of BTS who has a solo song called Seven that he is promoting, currently the number one song on Billboard. Number two, like many celebrities, he has a fake burner TikTok account that he uses to watch videos without fans knowing what he's seeing and what he's liking and all of that. Number three, Weverse is a fan platform for K-pop groups that BTS posts on. 
Here's what you're going to do with that information. Understand this story. Tuesday, Jungkook posted a link on Weverse to a TikTok dance challenge video, except he created the link from TikTok while logged into his burner account. So when people clicked on the link on Weverse, it took them to TikTok. And then TikTok popped up a banner saying, Ian shared this video. Watch and follow. But since Jungkook had posted it on Weverse, they're like, well, it's pretty clear that Ian is Jungkook's account. So what's going on with that? Uh, everyone started to see. Jungkook admitted, he's like, ah, I screwed up. That, that's definitely my account. Uh, he changed the name of the profile from Ian to JK uh, to kind of let people know, like, yeah, I'm not going to pretend it's not me. PC Mag's Kim Key has used this as an opportunity to share some basic TikTok privacy tips. Uh, so go check those out over at PCMag.com. Uh, things like don't share links while logged into an account you want to keep secret. Uh, <laughs> and uh, ways to make your account private so that only approved followers can see your videos and other tips like that. That's good stuff to remember. I, I only have one TikTok account. I don't post to it, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm logged in all the time. Um, but uh, I have multiple Instagram accounts. None of them are burners. It's me and my dog. But I've gotten this wrong more than once. You know, I'm just going too fast. I forget where I'm logged in. You know, I'm, I, I toggle back and forth all the time anyway. Facebook, this has happened. Let's see, what else besides Facebook? I've sent lots of emails from an address I didn't want to send them from. Not a secret one, but just not the appropriate one. So yeah, these are, these are good reminders that even uh, mega superstar K-pop band members um, also need a reminder now and then. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Never had a burner account for anything. Is that weird? Should I have a you, burner account? Would you something? say if you Only did? Only if you want to be looking at stuff and no one associated with Scott Johnson. I guess that's exactly so. what just, someone with a burner account would say, though. That's exactly sure right. Yeah, you'll never know if I'm really making this up or not, but it just I feels know. weird to have one. I don't yeah. know. It's never. <laughs> well, it's one of those things where there's an official BTS account. Yeah. And you don't want to have all the members of BTS using that. But you also don't want people like, oh, what did they like? What did they see? You know, you just don't want the pressure. You just want to be able to monitor what's up oh, there. Oh, wait, so. I do have a burner Facebook account. In fact, I have two. Oh, no kidding. Well, look at you I hadn't Facebook. thought about it in a while because I haven't needed them. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to be honest here. Unlike Scott Johnson. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, You're welcome. You, you know, it's you it's, brought integrity back. Transparency to the show. is important yeah. on a show like exactly. TKNS. I exactly. have two Facebook burner accounts. Find me if you dare. Uh, and then let us know by email. Speaking of, let's check out the mailbag. Speaking of, we were talking about uh, the desktop or laptop experience versus, say, a mobile device on GDI yesterday. And Marty wrote in saying, "I used to find myself getting annoyed with how long thing." how long some things take on a mobile device. I eventually just stopped trying to do much other than quick actions on my phone. I find these days, unless it's a quick reply to somebody, I just wait until I get to my laptop to do whatever task I was trying to accomplish, which sometimes it's kind of silly, to be honest, because the total length of time, including waiting for me to get to my computer, can often be longer than I've, I just did the task on my phone in the moment. But for whatever reason, I just feel like I'm more productive that way. Uh, Marty says, P.S. As a Canadian, I must legally object to the advice of not saying sorry for things because we did say oh. Canadians, you don't always have to say sorry. Marty says, if we don't hit our sorry quota for the week, they take away our maple syrup. Uh, yeah. Man. So yesterday on Good Day Internet, I was talking about the course that I'm taking and the teacher telling people, don't say you're sorry, you're learning. That's fine. Uh, so, yeah, the Canadians have a much harder time with that. I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to uh, anybody being like, oh my gosh, you can do so many things on a mobile device. We also talked about that. You know, it's uh, everybody has their own, their own way of being productive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I am also very sorry. <laughs> uh, but we're not sorry that Scott Johnson was here because you not can't at all. do the show without you on a day like Taco Wednesday. Mm. So Scott, let folks know where they can keep up with you the rest of the week. I look forward to your future of just daily taco. Forget about days, like just every day. Every day is taco day. Yeah, well, it um, kind of is in, in our hearts. I try to keep everyday taco day on the Frog Pants Network. And if you are interested in video game shows or content that happens in the morning, I have a morning show, for example, movies, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I just point your your squinties over to frogpants.com, specifically the Frog Pants uh, podcast area. You'll find something you like in there. I'm almost sure of it. So go check it out. That's frogpants.com. And uh, I don't know, have your pick. 
You've been hearing these emails from people who react to the stuff we talk about on the extended show. Uh, so if you haven't got it already, get good day internet in your life. All you got to do is become a patron, patreon.com slash DTNS. Today, we're going to talk about YouTube's new creation tools like remixing effects, new live options for creators for its short form platform, something I know Scott's interested in. So mm -hmm. stick around. You can also catch our show live Monday through Friday. We do it at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And we'd love to have you join us live if you can. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>